All right, maybe we should go ahead and start with the introduction to the session to make sure we have as much time as possible to hear from our wonderful speakers today. So while I make the usual introduction, if you want to share on the chat what has inspired you this week, that would be great because it's not been maybe a fantastic week in terms of world news. And so yeah. let's try to keep it positive and find things to get yeah. inspired by. Hmm. So welcome everyone to the expert session. And as all, not all, most of you know, this is our retreat's purpose. This is why we're doing these sessions. This is why we're gathering to lay the foundation for how we will work together and face future challenges with courage. And courage means to this group all of these things. And today, these words will still be important because we're here to hear from people who are doing great things, who are here to clarify our thoughts about um, things to consider for the future of IOI. So let's keep this idea of courage in mind today as well. And this is the journey we have been through and that is ahead of us. We, so we are about midway through our retreat. So today we have the expert session, then we'll have the investment elements workshop next week and the closing session. So we're almost there, uh, but there's still a lot of great stuff and a lot of important um, discussions to be had about the future of IOI. So for today, we're here to get inspired and to these sessions are designed to help us expand our frame of reference for what is possible. And this will be divided in two parts. The first one will be reimagining how we think of investment and the second one about nonprofit effectiveness and assessment. So today our interaction will be mostly um, written. So please use the chat to share questions that you may have for our speakers. We can promise that we will have the time to cover all of them, but they will be considered. And also use the plus one to tell us what is resonating with you. Use the chat to have a conversation uh, between each other. The chat is your home today. And also, if you want, you can use the shared documents, um, the shared notes document, and Carla can share the link on the chat uh, as well um, to help you get there quicker. So that's it. And so without any further ado, let's go into part one. And part one will be a conversation between Caitlin and Pia, the co-founder of open collective and this session is designed as a conversation with a representative of an organization pushing the limits of how we think of investing in serving communities our perspectives on community owned infrastructure financial transparency and services and her approaches to maximizing well-being are ones we want to draw inspirations from at our work at ioi so caitlin over to you and I'll see. Thank you, Sarah. Perfect. All right, so first off, I wanna formally welcome Pia Mancini, uh, who I'll have introduced herself in a moment. Um, also to note that I've had the good fortune to get to know Pia more um, through some work that we've done around Open Collective Foundation. So just as a disclosure that I'm on the board of Open Collective Foundation, um, and this has been one of the things that I wanted to kind of bring into the discussion for for IOI in terms of a number of things that I've been learning through that process. Um, so Pia, huge <laughs> Pia, huge thanks for being here. Pia is also um, wrapping up her holiday and calling in from Uruguay. So um, also thank you for for joining us in that sort of capacity. But to start things off, I'd love to um, have you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about what you do. <laughs> Sorry, didn't even know that Google did that. Um, so um, hi, everyone. Sorry about that. I'm Pia Mancini. 
Um, I'm calling in today from Uruguay. Um, so please do let me know if my internet connection gets like, you know, flaky and you can't hear me because I won't notice. Um, so I'm, I was born in Argentina, currently live in Spain. I am the co-founder and CEO of Open Collective and previously did um, a lot of work in the democracy space. I chaired the Democracy Earth Foundation and also worked on a project called Democracy OS. Um, so yeah, that's me. I have a daughter called Roma that she might walk in any minute, hopefully not, <laughs> but she's six years old and we all live together in Madrid. Perfect. Thank you, Pia. Um, so for those who might not be as familiar with Open Collective, can you talk a little bit more, hi Roma, can you Thank talk you. a little bit more about what is Open Collective and also how that idea came about? Yes, of course. Um, so Open Collective is essentially a solution for, so the problem that we're trying to solve is we think communities around the world need access to funding in order to be sustainable. But the system that we have forces them to become something that they are not. It forces them to become a legal entity that is incorporated somewhere in the world in order to receive funding, right? And the communities that we work with, they do not wanna become legal entities. They do not wanna pay upfront the costs of setting up a charity or a non-for-profit or even, even deciding where in the world they're gonna set up this charity or non-for-profit. There are groups that they come together to collaborate and um, for a certain period of time, think of open source projects or mutual aid groups. Um, so Open Collective was born to support these communities and give them access to, to um, funding, allowing companies and foundations to, to give them funding. And so it's a two-part solution. On the one hand is an open source and transparent platform that lets these groups, these communities manage their funding transparently. So receive and spend money transparently. And on the other hand is a network of 300 nonprofits around the world that act as custodians of those funds, right? So it's, 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 a, it's two things, it's a platform and a network of existing legal entities that essentially lend these communities their legal um, status, their bank account, and allows and allow them to receive uh, funding. Tell us a little bit more. I know you mentioned in that um, service to the open source communities, as well as kind of mutual aid groups. Can you tell us a little bit more about that evolution and what that looks like in terms of the groups that have kind of naturally gravitated to open collective and what that looks like? Sure. Um, so we grew very quickly in the open source space because the open source ecosystem was ripe for something like Open Collective to happen. So open source had already won the cultural battle against Microsoft, right? Essentially, Microsoft went from open source is a cancer to you know having Visual Studio and um, Azure and buying GitHub. Right. So open source already had had already won that. And so that meant that the ecosystem. So if you pair that with kind of the the, um, the growth that the Internet Web 2 had with all of the applications were based um, created on top of that, that use open source, the cost of starting for all of these um, companies or projects went from oh, we need $2 million on a, to spend on a mainframe to zero because we're using all of this open source technology, right? So all of that took place. So the open source ecosystem was huge by the time we started six years ago. And it wasn't more, a, it wasn't anymore a question of like, oh, should we all use open source or closed, closed source? That's not even a discussion anymore. But the problem was that all of these companies were building their projects, winning millions of dollars on top of this open source technology that was maintained by volunteers around the world, right? And so these companies were like, okay, hang on a second. We either need to give back. We also wanna hire from these, these communities. We need to start supporting them. We want them to keep doing what they're doing. And so Google turns around, for example, and says like, okay, I wanna support all of these open source projects. It's impossible for Google to send PayPal, to send money to a PayPal account in, you know, you name the country, right? It's, it's just not gonna happen. Google needs someone to do procurement, needs someone that can provide an invoice and that's where we step in. So we created the open source collective that is this 
501c6 um, to support open source projects around the world. And we currently host, um, so we give fiscal sponsorship to over 3,000 open source projects. Last year alone, we moved money from, we moved $12 million from companies to the open source community just in 2021 alone. Um, so that was what the open source ecosystem had was it had GitHub, right? It had this place that enabled all of this growth and, and flourishing to happen. And so when we stepped in, it was it was it was ready. It was it was ripe for that. Um, and we we struggled a little bit in figuring out what the next big vertical, if you want, what the next big kind of space was going to be for us, because on the one hand, we knew that open source was a local maximum, right? We knew that there was a lot of work to be done there, but our mission wasn't only the open source ecosystem, was communities at large, if you want. Um, and so it was difficult for us to figure out where the next kind of, you know, really big leap was going to come from us. And then 2020, enter COVID. And suddenly the Open Collective Foundation um, went from managing $300,000 as a 501c3 to $5 million in like 10 months, right? And all of that growth came from mutual aid groups and groups doing um, early COVID detection, um, supporting each other in, in, in times like crisis responders, meals for frontline workers, right? Um, and so again, we just had you know, the wave was coming, we had our board built, we knew how to swim, we just st stood up and, 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 you know, we served it. And, and now OCF is as big as the open source ecosystem for us, like the open source foundation. Thank you for that, Pia. Um, in terms of, I know that, and again, this is from getting to know you through the work for the Open Collective Foundation, you know, when you speak of Open Collective, um, just for clarity for the groups here, can you speak a little bit more about the different entities that exist? Because I know we have a um, specific question from Richard about the 501c6 um, yes. decision and, and what led you to that? Yeah, sure. Um, so, okay, so everything that is named Open and Collective is my fault. And I apologize like regularly for that, right? I should have thought this maybe more, but I didn't. And so we have the Open Collective Foundation and the Open Source Collective, and it's this whole, you know, this whole constellation of open collectives. Um, so this is this is how it works. We have the open, the, the, the platform that is the, that's done by Open Collective Inc. So that's our company. It's like your classic Delaware C Corp with investors and safes and, you know, the whole, boring Silicon Valley kind of template. And, and, and that's the, the, the corporation. And the role of Open Collective Inc. is to develop and build the Open Collective platform, which is this open source platform that groups use um, to raise and spend money transparently. And then we created this kind of, we wanted to, um, to prove the point. You know, this is something I've done many times in my life. I even created a political party to prove a point at one point. But essentially, we needed to prove that this could work. So we started by also creating host organizations ourselves. So we created the, the 501c6, and we created the Open Collective Foundation. We created Open Collective Europe, Open Collective UK, Open Collective New Zealand. So we start. it's almost like seeding, right? We knew we wanted to enable communities to fundraise and do what they 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 love to do their impact instead of um worrying about accountants and lawyers right and um and so we started by creating this network and now the platform also allows for external organizations to host their own network so the dotnet foundation hosts the dotnet user groups on open collective the php foundation hosts their own thing um, there's like a, a, um, a non-profit in the UK that hosts like the UK mutual group. And so, um, yeah, that's, you know, more or less the, the whole um, ecosystem. And why we chose the 501c6 was the other question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so that was out of necessity. The IRS doesn't really understand open source. 
and they think that open source software can't be in the public interest, can't be something that is a charity, right? Because, because the rationale behind their, um, their thinking is that companies are using that project to make money, right? And so we can't, you know, we can't host open source projects as like a, as a charity because someone else is using the product of that um, project mm -hmm. for financial benefit. And so many projects struggled with trying to create a 501c3 um, for open source. Um, and 501c6 is like the best um, next thing, I would say. It's you need to think of it as a league of business, which actually makes a lot of sense to us, right? Because at the end of the day, we are doing like the trade union of open source, right? It's a league of business and it's, um, it's, it's an entity that allows us to have, to be tax exempt, which is like super important for us, um, obviously, but also because we're not giving tax deductible receipts, we have less oversight or less kind of requirements. And at the same time, most of the people giving into the 501c6 or institutions are companies. So they just write this mm -hmm. off as an expense, right? Mm -hmm. No, that's helpful. And I know that I know that Mozilla, for example, is probably one of the biggest um, biggest sort of instances of this tension around creating the um, you know not for profit public interest balance there too, um, which we can get into it another time. Um, one of the things that I wanted to explore with you, because I know that this has been something that for Open Collective in terms of the umbrella, but particularly for Open Collective, the platform, um, and just to kind of clarify for folks here, you know, um, when Pia talks about financial transparency, like everything is publicly viewable. If, if, is that right, Pia? Like by, yeah. you know, through money in, money out. Um, yes, absolutely. Yes, everything, but, um, yeah. all the way down to fees and yeah, everything except obviously private, you know, personal information. Yeah, um, but in terms of the the phrasing from uh, and the stance recently about the exit to community, um, would love to hear not only a little bit more about that, but just to kind of start about how you define community as it relates to your platform. Because I know this yeah. is a question that we've been um, exploring as a group for the past few weeks. Yeah, again, um, the concept is fluid, I guess. And, and we, 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 we treat it like a little bit, um, you know, in a messy kind of way, to be honest. But essentially, because we talk about communities in almost like we talk about collectives, which are the kind of the minimal units that we have um, using the platform, right? These, these groups, these communities, these people that come together, whether it's to create an open source project or to do a mutual aid group or to do research, right? Whatever it is, that's the collective. And we also call that a community, right? But at the same time, it's a bit like fractal, right? We have the, the, the communities that use the platform that we provide them fiscal sponsorship, but we, we then have like, I guess the larger open collective community, which is made up of this, you know, mix of, collectives, um, fiscal costs, so legal entities around the world, um, folks that are giving to those um, collectives, volunteers that work for those collectives. Um, so we have a bit of a, of, of a comprehensive understanding of community, if you want. I guess in there, there's obviously folks who have more I guess more skin in the game, right? So community organizers that are raising millions of dollars through Open Collective or, or that have a large community using Open Collective, they have um, a lot of interest in, in, in the platform and how the platform is run. Um, and then you, you, you have folks that are casually giving to collectives that they are part of our community and, and, and we do wanna engage with them obviously, but then I guess they have a bit of less in the game, right? Um, yeah. So it, 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 it's a combination of thousands of individuals, um, funders, um, three, 400 legal entities around the world, and thousands of communities that are, they all, all have their own, you know, 
and mm. internal governance and mechanisms and missions and yeah it's a big thing <laughs> um given that that financial transparency component and the platform reliance um do you find that certain groups are more likely to kind of gravitate towards choosing open collective to use versus say fiscal sponsors that i know you know we belong to or other groups here have worked closely with i think it's important look i think that I think that transparency doesn't necessarily create trust. Like, I don't think that if it's transparently, there's gonna be trust, right? I don't believe mm -hmm. in that because I think that trust is a much more complex thing. Um, and and if, if everything is out in the open, you mm -hmm. don't really trust, you just verify, right? So I think, I think, mm -hmm. I think it's different, but um, groups that are decentralized groups that are spread around the world groups that they don't necessarily have this regular face to face they rely on trans transparency helps enormously in those mm -hmm. contexts right because um it, it it makes fundraising and spending a lot easier it lowers the barriers mm -hmm. it, i know that it's, it, it can also raise some barriers like sometimes mm -hmm. you are you know, you feel uncomfortable submitting an invoice for your salary or for, you know, the, 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 you know, your time spent on a project and that being public. But at the same time, the fact that the rules are clear um, and that everyone knows what can be paid and what can't be paid, that you have a public expense policy, I think helps people who would be also, I guess, ashamed of asking to just know what the rules are, mm -hmm. right? The rules are clear and the rules are for everyone. Um, I think, so we've been very much in the, you know, radical transparency space. Um, and we've been kind of slowly building in some, I guess, protections for folks who can't necessarily afford the luxury of having that level of transparency, right? And mm -hmm. so, for example, we we have we you know we have a couple of collectives that are working in the trans um, community and supporting some of like health costs for or mental health costs. For example, we have a big group in in Austin that is doing that, and and so instead of like shutting down a collect making a collective private what we're doing is like we're allowing for incognito expenses for example right so the expense is still public but the person that is receiving the money might can be incognito we also have this difference now between your public name and your uh, legal name right because we were again we were exposing a lot of or we risked exposing a lot of people who because we the way fiscal sponsorship operates, like the the, the 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 fiscal sponsor needs the information of where the money went, like for real, yeah. right? And so we needed that legal name, but that doesn't mean that we needed to expose it. So again, mm. we've been building in the platform kind of provisions to protect mm. some folks. Oh, that's fascinating. And I know there's some some questions here um, that I, I want to follow up in, but I do want to get to this idea of the exit to community and sort of preceding this. And I know Pia, you and I have had some separate conversations about this and also with Nathan Schneider, who's at um, CU Boulder. Um, I know in our space, we've often faced this sort of, you know, is it not-for-profit versus for-profit or the commercial monopolies in the space and for the space that we operate in, a lot of that is kind of concentrated power and wealth and the um, and also buying up of infrastructure by big publishing companies um, and scientific journal companies buying up pieces of the kind of workflow and, and chain there. Um, I am really curious to hear a little bit more about what led to the decisions for Exit to Community, but also a little bit, um, if you could speak in your own words about what that means um, and how you're approaching that work. Yeah. Um, so I have more questions than answers here, right? I'm going to be very honest <laughs> with y'all. This is like, you know, uncharted yeah. waters. Um, there is no like clear roadmap. Um, so, you know, we're doing this together. So yeah. there. Um, so very early. So 
Open Collective is a weird type of company, right? Because it's a for-profit that is like has many nonprofit sisters, right? Or, or many nonprofits as part of the constellation. Uh, we rely a lot, we share profit with our nonprofits, right? Like 50-50, right? Like, so we are, we, mm. we were always a weird kind of beast. Um, the founders of Open Collective, we took um, 10 year vesting on our on our stock, which is absolutely uncommon, right? The common is like four year vesting, but I'm still like, I've been doing this for six years and I'm still vesting, you know, my ownership. Why? Because we know, we always knew that this was like a cultural kind of change and that our mission was a long-term mission, right? So we, we wanted to be very clear to our investors that if they are, were joining us, they were joining us like for the long term and they were here for the whole ride, right? Because if we were taking mm -hmm. 10 years, that's like the minimum horizon that they could expect, right? Like mm -hmm. we, 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 we wanted to signal very clearly that we're, okay, because we knew this was gonna take time. So that's one part of it. Like we, we know this is, something. and then when you take a long-term view of, of what you do and you think in like 50 years, for example, if, you, if what you do today, your mission, you know that it, what is true today is going to be true in 50 years, which this is our case. We, we know that communities need to be sustainable today and they will need to be sustainable in 50 years because the work that they do is the work that changes the world, right? So if you take that, that long-term view, you know you're not going to flip and sell your company in four years, right? And so, but you also know, most imp more importantly, that you're not going to be here forever, right? That you are like steward of a mission, that you are, this is your time, but then someone else is going to have to take on, right? To take over and take the reins because I'm not going to be doing this for 50 years, that's for sure, right? And so, so when you think in those terms, um, the options for a startup like ours to their risk, their founders, or to, um, um, to have this long-term view, um, they're not available to you, right? You don't want to IPO because you're a community-oriented company that you're never going to do hyper growth because your mission is more important than your growth, right? You need to be sustainable, and we worked very hard to be profitable, which we are, but we're not profitable at any cost, right? We, we, we do not want to do hyper growth. We're not gonna spend all the money that we have to grow the numbers to then sell. So IPO and that kind of hyper growth path is not, is not an option, right? Um, and then selling your company is not an option either because what you're doing is important and you think that it's gonna be right, you know, it's true today and in 50 years. So what do you do, right? How do you return money to your investors? Because we have really great investors that we want them to support other open collectives. Right, because they got us, you know, so far we're profitable, we would love to return money to them. Um, and obviously employees and, and, and founders. So how do you do that? Um, so this is where the kind of whole exit to community comes in place, right? We, we are a for-profit venture and we want to give ownership of this for-profit to the community as a for-profit. Right, as a project that is sustainable and is profitable, right? So how do you how do you do that? Right. The, the, the kind of the, the, the path we are in at the moment is trying to figure out what structure we can come up with to move ownership from privately held individuals and um, our cap table. I can talk more about that if you want to the community and what type of governance structure we can imagine for that community to successfully manage like a profitable business, like Open Collective that has, you know, not only is very mission driven, but it's also complex, right? Because it's, it, it's it, the technology that, that we do is not, it's not easy, right? Um, and so, so yeah, that's the mess I got everyone in. Um, so here we are. <laughs> You know, I, I mean, and I think that there is, um, there's so much interestingness there in terms of, you know, we often talk about certain pieces of the infrastructure that's been used for researchers or in scholarship being either for-profit or non-profit from the start. 
people work on that for say five to 10 years, sometimes a little bit more sell to an organization. I can understand that in terms of financial, you know, livelihood for an individual wanting to move on. But um, it often feels like from our stance from IOI, it kind of puts us on like a back foot of, well, how do you compete with like a $5 million, you know, acquisition offer by a big publisher? Like we can't, you know, move that forward. So I think what I found, I have found so interesting about some of the conversations around exit to community is really talking about flipping that or at least exploring what it would look like to really challenge that that assumption um and before we kind of turn it over for for questions from folks so please you know feel free to um either put those in the chat and we'll also have some question uh time in a, in a moment i'd love to know how have your investors reacted to the discussions around exit to community and what have those yeah. conversations been like um, so we had a first go at this in 2018. Um, so we raised, so Open Collective mm. raised $500,000 in 20, end of 2015, um, on a, on a PDF, on an idea, right? <laughs> and then we never knew how we wanted to, we, we never wanted to fundraise again. It wasn't in our DNA. I hate fundraising. My, my partners, like my co-founders hate fundraising as well. Like it's not what we want to spend our time on. And also we do not want to give up ownership of Open Collective, like that is like, crucial to us. And so after a lot of like deliberation, we ended up raising a small $300,000 round, like from friends and family, trying to, you know, get us forward, but like the numbers weren't, weren't happening for us. Like the, you know, we just weren't hitting what we needed to, and we all have families. This was like, you know, our, you know, um, the, the work we did to support our families and ourselves. So we needed to have enough mm -hmm. cash to support at least the three founders. Um, and, uh, and so we ended up raising a $2 million round in 2017. Um, and that was the last time we raised. Um, and um, we, we were very lucky because we had um, someone who wanted, who, this sounds awful, but it was like dumb money. He was like, I like you guys, here's a million dollars. If you give me 50% of your round, you know, I'm good. I don't even need to see you again, you know, use it. I like what you're doing. And we're like, right. And then we also had Bloomberg <laughs> Beta, which we wanted a lot more as an investor because we knew them, we know their thesis, we believe in what they do. They're very long-term thinking as well. They're very well connected. But, you know, for us, the key thing was to maintain control of the company and the board. Right. And we were willing to just let go of Bloomberg Beta and all their knowledge and all their networks if they, they wanted board seats. Um, and we told them that and we were very lucky. And they were like, okay, great. You know, we'll take the same terms as the other investor. So so they can't really do much, right? Mm -hmm. That said, they are extremely supportive. So we went to them mm -hmm. after this, a year after this round in 2018, with this like hi, exit to community, you know? It wasn't called exit to community back then, but it was the same concept. We're like, we want to do this trust and we want to have this group of stewards and we want them to control Open Collective. And they're like, are you making money? And we were like, no. And they were like, go back, you know, grow and then come back to us with this. And we we're like, okay, great, fine, you're right. And, um, and so this is our take two really of this, right? Mm -hmm. We did it in 2018 and we're doing it now. So when I came back to them this year, I'm like, okay, I heard you before, we are profitable. We have all of this growth, this revenue. Can we now talk about exit to community? And, and they're very supportive. A lot of the angel investors were like, yeah, if you just want to turn my investment into a donation, do it. Um, mm -hmm. Another fund was like, if you're doing a DAO, I'll do a token swap. Don't worry, equity token swap. Um, I guess... I guess by now they already know who we are and they know that we are not going to save their fund. We're not that unicorn and they're happy to see more of this in the world. I mean, Roy Bahat, who's on our, um, you know, the uh, managing partner of uh, Bloomberg Beta, he's actively advocating for um, trade, for uni worker unions in tech. Like, you know, that's the type of investor that we have. So they're, mm. they, you know, they're very supportive of this. And so I almost feel like it's 
I have this sense of responsibility. I'm like, I have all of these great things. I might as well just try and build a roadmap, um, you know, a blueprint for other companies to come closer to doing this, right? They might not all have the same terms that we we were, you know, lucky enough to have, mm. but um, but if we were successful in this, like we're, I, th I feel we're gonna open up a maneuvering space for other companies to start thinking about this. And, and that is part of like, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. Mm, thank you for that. Um, also, I want to make sure folks can get their ready, their questions ready if you have it. Otherwise, I can continue talking to Pia until we take a bit of a break between this and the next session. Um, Pia, you often talk about this as sort of building the infrastructure for the commons, um, very much aligned with you know, many of the things that we're looking to do, it's a slightly different sector for, for IOI and, and talking about that sort of um, future we're looking to enable. Uh, and would love to know from your perspective, you know, what work is left to be done? Yeah, so I was thinking about that um, earlier today. I think that everything that we can do to lower the costs of new ideas to happen in the world, it's worth pursuing, right? And so we do it from a financial perspective, but there, what, we are awful at the governance aspect of this. We do not have good infrastructure for communities to govern themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there is a big space there to provide tooling um, for communities to do once they have money, because before they didn't have money, right? And now they have money and they need to manage this money, right? So, um, and we, we do not provide that. And we are notoriously bad at helping them, you know, sometimes with, with, with that tooling, just because it's not our focus. Um, so I think that infrastructure for managing the commons in terms of governance, I think there's still a lot of work to be done there. I, I, I know there's like co-budget and other projects, but nothing in the scale that we are doing. And I would love to see someone providing support mm -hmm. to the you know, thousands of communities that we have um, to better decide how to spend their money, whether that's like you know, participatory budgeting tooling, but it has to be like low tech, it has to be accessible, it has to be agnostic of open collective as well, right? Um, mm -hmm. so, so I think that there's, there, there, there's, there's work to be done there. And I'm excited about that work, to be honest. Um, where we are going with Open Collective in terms of like open infrastructure is we want to, we're gonna be building up Open Collective as an API. So we're gonna be building up Open Collective mm -hmm. as rails for other projects to provide services to these communities, right? So mm -hmm. if someone does a better job at data visualization for expenses, as we do, which is zero in our case, like then you should be able to do it for Open Collective. If someone has like a better governance, you know, tooling for collectives to decide how to spend their money, they should be able to build it and plug it into Open Collective, right? To use Open Collective as an API to, to provide services for these communities. So we are gonna be like, my, my hope is that we're gonna be almost like, like kickstarting a new economy where the communities are the center, right? Where the community is this new economic unit that has economic power. And so we have to support communities transacting with each other, um, users providing, or you know, individuals providing services to these communities that now can pay for these services, uh, job boards, um, I don't know, like um, um, health, you know, or healthcare or benefits for people that are making a living being paid out of their communities, right? Like, I think there is a lot of space, um, a lot of work to be done there. And I, I guess that's where Open Collective is, is going and what we want to see in the world. Thank you for that, Pia. Um, I'm conscious of time, and I know we wanted to take a, a bit of a break before we get to the, the next session. So first off, huge thanks, Pia. Um, I also wanted to um, vocalize, Amy, do you want to vocalize your question or do you want me to, do me to it's up to you. 
Okay, I, I can, I'll read that for you. Um, so Amy Sample Ward, one of our new steering committee members, um, is curious about what the work is and how it has taken shape to educate or build capacity for the 300 um, collectives and fiscal sponsor orgs so that they can be deeply engaged in these strategic conversations. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the 300 are, are fiscal sponsors, right? They are existing nonprofits. Um, the collectives are like, thousands of communities inside of those um, fiscal hosts. Um, we struggle with that. And the reason we struggle with that is the following. We, our business model is not well aligned with giving a ton of support to these groups because Open Collective is free for fiscal hosts who do not charge hosting fees, right? So imagine if Code for Science and Society, for example, didn't charge a fiscal sponsorship fee, it would be free for them, right? Because we, the way we see it is like, if you're just supporting your community, we're gonna support you, right? And if, but if you're making money, then you're a professional fiscal host, then we have a shared revenue model with you, right? In which we keep 15% um, of your fiscal, of your hosting fee, right? So if you charge 10%, we give a 15% of that 10%, right? It's not a lot of money, right? You need a lot of scale to make money with, with, with this. Where we make our, our, our revenue is with the, the fiscal host that we created because we invest a lot and we share revenue like equally. And, and so we struggle with that and we've struggled all of these years because we don't make any money. But now that we are profitable, we, we are starting to, to support them a lot more, right? Because now, you know, we, we can afford to do it essentially. I, I mean, we're not hugely profitable, but you know, we, we make ends meet. Um, and so we are starting a um, sort of host, I don't know, not, not school, but like mentorship program, right? That we're gonna be starting because we wanna help them, you know, deal with the same kind of problems that we deal in our own fiscal hosts and help them grow their community and um, um, and, and all of that jazz. So we, we've been holding like monthly calls with fiscal hosts, but I don't think it's enough. Like we're gonna be doing a much more deliberate kind of host school if you want um, to support them. Yeah, that's coming up, yeah. Thank you for that. It's a great question. Um, any other questions that folks have while we have Pia here? Otherwise, I'll go back up to Richard's question. Maybe I'll do that while, you, while folks are thinking. Um, so you mentioned earlier that in terms of transparency, that transparency doesn't build trust necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, what does build trust in your, in your opinion? Um, I think clarity builds trust. You know, I think clarity and time. Like when the rules are clear, you trust the rules, right? And I think that is super important. It's it's a little bit like democracy, right? You want clear rules and are an uncertain results, right? For elections, if you have certain results, then you know it's not really free elections, right? So you you want that kind of clarity, I think, in rules and transparent transparency. I think helps a lot to build trust there. Um, what we did to be trustworthy is not only be transparent about like our, you know, salaries, our fees, our revenue, our everything that is transparent and it's open, but also we are very, very available to help folks um, see our thinking process. And I think that builds a lot of trust. When, 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 you, when you're able to learn with, your community and when you are i am i'm always you know uh, and it's, this is not just me like we are always very honest about what what our shortcomings are I, honesty is something that for us is very very important it's one of our core values and how we are honest about our own problems and shortcomings and things that we don't do well um, as well as honest about our numbers i think that builds a lot of trust that honestly, when honestly, when you you really live the way you know, you live your values. You make decisions according to your values. Um, yeah, at least that's really what we try to do. Yeah. 
Thank you, Pia. Um, we have room for one more question if anybody wants to sneak that in. Give folks a moment. <laughs> Richard putting a quote in the chat. Leslie, go ahead. Thank you, Pia. I, really uh, very um, informative uh, uh, discussion. Um, thank you for all the work you've done. Uh, I'm learning a lot. And the question I keep asking myself is, why hasn't the scholarly communication communities, quote, come up with any mutual aid kind of um, arrangement, right? Until IOI came along, there's really not much thinking about uh, collective mutual aids because we all do things individually. You know, this institution do this and this institution do that. And often there are counter, uh, you know, countering each other in many cases, right? And so I'm just trying to think why we are so slow and reluctant to act as collective and to think about mechanisms that could help us, you know, build these kind of infrastructure uh, because we do have the resources and the talent. What was missing? <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Like, I, I think in systems terms, Leslie, I think that we have a system that is producing a certain kind of results, right? If you have a, if you have a system that believes that the members of those systems operate in a scarcity driven economy, then competition is gonna be the norm. Right, it, it's I, I get I get in democracy. Sorry, so like my default thinking. But when you think about political institutions, if you are only called to say yes or no to a system once every couple of years, that system is going to produce apathy because they're not engaging you in the process. So apathy is a feature of the political system. It's not a bug, right? So in the same in the same vein, I think that competition is a feature of the way. Um, our economic system is designed or financial system, you know, the whole thing. Um, and not, it's not a bug, right? It's like, what is what, what is expected of, expected of us by the system? Um, and so it's very difficult, for example, for companies to make gifts to one another, right? It's almost impossible. You need to, you can't really give something as a gift if you're a, a for-profit. They, do, they don't understand. You can give it to a non-for-profit, but you can't give it to a for-profit. I think that's insane, right? Because we, and so I think the situation that we found find ourselves in is, is that we have a society that is out of sync with institutions that govern that society. And, and we need to start, and, and so, okay, so if we assume that that is what I'm saying is more or less, you know, reasonable, we are out of sync with our institutions, then the question is like, how do you, what do you do, right? And so you have, in my mind, you have three paths forward. You either are like, okay, revolution, and we're going to throw everything down and we're going to build from scratch. You know, you're going to say, okay, we're going to get into the system and try to change the system from within, win elections, you know, try to do this. Or you yeah, burn it down. Yeah, exactly. So you burn it down or you change it from within or you build alternatives, right? And so what you are doing, what we are doing is like this sandboxes of innovation, of economic, political, you know, organizational innovation that we can test these things because no one knows, right? And, and because the current system has been developing and it has been cementing um, for hundreds of years. And now here we are and we can't really think or say this way of doing things is going to replace it. Like cooperatives are going to replace, you know, corporations. It's not going to happen, right? What we need to do is we need to start experimenting, building these sandboxes, and then and then bringing people over, right? I think Web three has been really good at doing that. They're like, you know, screw this system. We're just going to build this whole shiny thing here, and you know, we're, they're going to have our rules, and it's going to be outside of the system. Like I want to do that, but talking to the existing system. Right. I want to do that by building these bridges or so like interfacing, right? So open collective is like building around the way things work now by really pushing the boundaries of what has been done with these type of structures um, and hoping to start kind of discovering this alternative way of doing things. Thank you so much for that, Pia. Um, I unfortunately do need to cut us in terms of time because I want to make sure folks have a little bit of a break before we come back um, at the top of the hour. Um, Pia, that is a great way to end uh, this initial 
piece of our conversation and an expert session. And on behalf of all of us, I want to just thank you for, for joining us and sharing your perspective and your experiences. Great. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. much, Pia. You have a great session. And I'm obviously available for you know future conversations. Thank you, Pia. Um, and for everybody,